Oh, there's the call. There's the call. Great. Terrific. Good to go. Well, good morning, everyone. There you go. Woke you up, Nicole. Good, good morning. You made it. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we know you're out there. I feel a little bit like uh, we all feel like radio disc jockeys. Uh, uh, we know our audience is out there. We just can't see you. But I want to welcome you all on this rainy morning to the Chamber's annual conversation with our distinguished Valley Legislative Delegation. Uh, my name is Bill Purcell. I'm your devoted Chamber President. I'm going to serve as your host this morning, uh, together with my dear friend Kelly Wade Batucci, who I'll introduce in a moment. You know, it's perhaps fitting that we would gather uh, on this day, uh, April 15th, which under normal circumstances would be a tax deadline day. Uh, you all have a reprieve until May 17th, um, but these are not normal times. Um, and so rather than gather as we traditionally have done in the beautiful conference center at Perkin Elmer uh, here in Shelton, as uh, we have over the past few years, we're meeting virtually. And for some of you, this may be a, a new platform uh, called uh, Air Meet. Um, we know that uh, many of you are suffering from Zoom fatigue, so we thought we'd introduce this new platform. We used it very successfully uh, uh, last month uh, with uh, David Lehman, the Commissioner of DECD, and John Trainer during our Economic Outlook breakfast. Uh, and this is a natural uh, uh, sequence to that event as we talked about the foundation of our economy and how we talk about public policy this morning. Um, so Mike DeVito, I know you're out there from Perk and Elmer. Uh, with God's good grace, we'll be back uh, next spring uh, at the Perk and Elmer conference room uh, with all of you. Um, let me begin by thanking the members of the Valley Legislative Delegation who have honored us with your presence here this morning. But more importantly, uh, thank you for your dedicated public service and your leadership during these very, very difficult times. Um, I'm proud to report that we have one, two, three, four, five, six out of nine. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a voting block here, six out of our nine uh, distinguished. And we do expect Dave Labriola, so he may, he may join us as well, Representative De Labriola, which would bring us uh, to seven out of nine. Um, and to our distinguished legislators, I know you joined me in thanking the many Valley business and community leaders who have joined our call this morning um, and thank them for their interest in public policy um, and our shared interest in, uh, in uh, advancing our economy here in the state of Connecticut. We have some uh, little bit of noise in the background. Uh, finally, let me give special thanks to our friends at AT&T for their continued sponsorship of this special event over the past several years. Um, I think uh, our legislators know AT&T has been a leader in reshaping the world of technology, media, and telecommunications. Now for the past 144 years, and under the leadership of John Amra, uh, the president of uh, AT&T Connecticut, company has really been a positive force and a strong corporate leader in our state. We're so happy to have Kelly Wade Batucci back with us again. She's going to introduce each of you in turn. Uh, Kelly is the Regional Director of External and Legislative Affairs for AT&T Connecticut. She's enjoyed a remarkable 25-year uh, career, a quarter of a century. Uh, she's still a youngster, <laughs> still a youngster, but she's done it all from uh, network delivery to sales to operations to project management, training, and marketing. In her current role, Kelly's responsible for advancing the legislative and regulatory agenda for the company and serves uh, as the company's link uh, in community relations. She's a former director of the chamber, and when she was here, she uh, led our government affairs committee, and she has remained a close friend and confidant uh, to uh, the chamber over these many years. So, Kelly, with that, would you please introduce our distinguished guest? Certainly. Um, I, I do want to just, you know, quickly say thank you. I'm so excited that everybody uh, was able to join this morning. Um, I was reflecting last night on the last time that we met, which was, you know, late January um, of last year. And, you know, so much has changed. Um, I think we've all gained a greater appreciation for what matters most in our lives. Um, you know, our businesses have been tested. Um, but I think, um, you know, the strength of our commitment to our communities and our employees has endured. Um, and a lot of that has been, um, you know, uh, facilitated by the partnership that we have with the chamber and the leadership role that they've provided within the community. 
um, you know, for businesses and residents alike. So, you know, every year we're really excited about sponsoring this event. You know, we really think it's important to maintain an open dialogue um, with our elected officials so that we can, um, you know, have a seat at the table when we talk about the things that, that affect us all. And so um, we really appreciate you all taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this morning. Um, and with that, I'd like to just quickly uh, kick this off. I'd like to first introduce, um, I'm, I'm gonna basically go through and introduce each legislator. And I'd like to ask each of you um, after I'm done um, letting folks know, um, you know the, the district and the committees that you serve on, um, if you could just tell us what is is really your your priority for this year, um, what is you know in particular a bill or you know a concept that you've been working on um, in your committees um, that is really you know from your perspective, if you can get this one thing done this year, this is really going to make a difference um, you know for for the constituents that you serve. So I'd, I'd like to start uh, with Senator uh, Kevin Kelly, who is the Senate Republican leader who represents Monroe, Seymour, Shelton, and Stratford. Um, he is ranking member of aging and legislative management and also serves on executive and legislative noms and uh, reg review. Um, and so with that, Senator Kelly, what do you see as your, your most important issue um, as we go into this year? I think you're muted, Senator. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, I, I lost the connection there for a moment. You know, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> reality never always works the way you plan it to do. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for the introduction. You want my top legislative priority right now? I, I think I think as we move through, it'll give everybody a chance to just have a moment to, to talk about the thing that matters most to them. <laughs> okay, well, uh, first and foremost, uh, we all recognize that Connecticut is unaffordable. Uh, that is the key uh, issue, I think, that every person, every business, every entity in the state of Connecticut experiences. And it's something that is just crushing uh, the middle class family. Uh, we believe that there are ways and there's policy choices that are made in Hartford to place us as, uh, in the position of being dead last in job growth, dead last in personal income growth. Uh, which has impacted the Connecticut family and the economy of Connecticut. And we think we have a better way. Uh, and I think the best example of that is the initiative uh, looking at health care. Uh, Democrats promised affordable health care eight years ago and have yet to deliver on that promise. Uh, and that was due in large part that it wasn't properly nor sustainably funded in Washington. And there's an opportunity to do so uh, where we can do a state-based reinsurance program uh, and leverage federal dollars to Connecticut to do that. Now, the Republicans have a plan that would reduce premium by 30%, would actually get its arms around the high cost, the real true driver of health care, which is the medical cost, and tear a page out of Republican Governor Charlie Baker's book, where he was able to reduce the cost of growth in medical from 10 to 12 percent per year to bring it down to less than four saving massachusetts billions of dollars and also uh keep good paying connecticut jobs in the insurance industry right here in connecticut now there were three bills that were put forward in insurance one was a public option which would give you the same premium reduction but would go into direct competition with Connecticut's flagship industry and cost thousands of good paying middle class jobs. There was another bill proposed by the, the governor that dealt with the same reinsurance issue, but didn't get its arms around the true cost of medical care. And then there was ours. The Democrats passed out of committee two bills, the one that kills jobs and the one that doesn't deal with cost growth. The, the cost of true medical uh, expenses in the state of Connecticut. The one that would actually bring relief to the middle class family. And oh, by the way, the, the governor's bill increases, uh, has a tax on insurance of $50 million. The one that didn't pass committee was the actual bill that would provide the premium relief, reduce costs, and didn't include new taxes. This is why Connecticut is unaffordable. 
It's why we are dead last in job growth. It's why we are dead last in personal income growth because of the choices in Hartford. We could choose to keep good paying jobs. We could choose to get our arms around the high cost of medical care. And we could choose to do that within the current budget sacrifice that middle class taxpayers make. Democrats in Hartford want none of that. And they're choosing options that both increase taxes on the middle class and kill good paying jobs. Hopefully you can stay tuned and, and help us to help you to help middle class Connecticut survive in unaffordable Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I'm sure that we may have some rebuttal um, and discussion on this topic again. Um, but I do want to move on to uh, Senator Berthel. Um, and I just um, wanted to you know, welcome you. And uh, Senator represents Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem, Bridgewater, Middlebury, Oxford, Roxbury, Seymour, Southbury, Washington, Watertown, and Woodbury. Um, is ranking member of Banking and Education and Human Services and a member of the Veterans Affair. Um, and so, Senator, um, what do you see as your, your greatest priority this session? Uh, Kelly, good morning and thank you. Morning. Bill, thank you again to the, uh, to the Chamber for putting this event together. You know, in addition to what uh, Senator Kelly just spoke to, I, I think that our caucus is really very sensitive and very highly focused on uh, on our economy and, and doing what's right for the middle class in Connecticut. Uh, and I think that, that this session um, should have been about primarily about, uh, about economic recovery and getting Connecticut out of the pandemic and continuing to move forward. But Kelly, in direct answer to your question, I would say to you that as the ranking member of the Education Committee, and this is gonna take a slightly different, different um, uh, track, if you will, than what Senator Kelly just spoke to, but equally as important, and I'll tie it together when I'm done, you know, we have seen now over the last 14 months in our public and private uh, education uh, delivery throughout Connecticut, we have terrific public schools. We have many private and parochial schools right here in the, in the valley that serve our K through 12 community very well. But what we've seen in all of these schools is we've seen essentially a loss of, uh, of an academic year, despite the, the, the Herculean, sometimes Herculean efforts of educators and administrators and staff and faculty in all of these schools to you know, keep the wheels on the bus, no pun intended, uh, keep our students engaged, keep them learning. What the education committee realized when we spoke with our uh, then commissioner of education, Miguel uh, uh, Cardona, who's now our US secretary of education and with the department was that we have a very, uh, uh, very high and important responsibility, first of all, as an education committee in the legislature to ensure that we are doing absolutely what's right for every child in the state of Connecticut. They are the future. They're, they're the ones that, you know, Lincoln said many, many years ago, the classroom of today is the government of tomorrow, right? So we have to make sure that we're doing right by those children, preparing them for, uh, for manufacturing jobs, preparing them for college, preparing them for their future. But in this moment right now, what we are up against is this. We don't know. We do not know where any of our students are in K through 12 in terms of what they've learned, what they haven't learned, what we need to do to get them back on track. We know there's a, there's a remarkably disturbing social and emotional aspect to learning that has affected our, our youngest kids at, at, in kindergarten at five years old, all the way through our high school seniors who will be ending, uh, you know, ending their high school careers in the next, uh, next six weeks or so. And I think that the, the charge of the education committee uh, is to make sure that we are doing uh, assessments to understand where these children are at, to support our schools, make sure that our teachers and, and faculty and staff can feel safe in those school buildings. But we really need to uh, need to kind of hit a reset button here and say, what do we need to do to ensure that that the class of whatever grade they were in, the classes of 19 through 21, um, are really positioned just as well as the children before them um, and the ones that will come after them to have the best opportunity as they move through uh, through 12th grade and get out into the real world. And that is, it's not going to be cheap. Uh, it's going to take a lot of effort. Uh, but I think from my standpoint, again, in agreeing with everything that Senator Kelly, Senator, sorry, Senator <laughs> Kelly, I'll be all right. Let me have some coffee. Hold on. <laughs> everything that Senator Kelly said already about the economy and what's broken in Connecticut. 
we have, uh, from my viewpoint, we have a very high responsibility to fix our public education system for primary and secondary education. And I just want to make a note, I do have a hard stop for about 827. I have another meeting I have to get to. So if I just disappear, it's not because anyone has upset me and I couldn't take it anymore. It's that I have another <laughs> But thank you, Kelly. I appreciate a few minutes to provide that insight. Yep, yep. And we understood that, and that's uh, exactly why I've done the format this way, so that they would you would have a chance to, to speak. Yeah, I appreciate um, the accommodation. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so next, uh, we'll move on to uh, State Representative Jason Perillo, uh, who represents Shelton. He is the Deputy House Republican Leader, um, as well as a member of the Executive and Legislative Nominations, Finance, Revenue and Bonding, Insurance and Real Estate, and Legislative Management. Um, and so, uh, Representative Perillo, uh, look forward to hearing what, what your focus is for this year. Kelly, thanks a lot. Um, you know, Eric and... Kevin hit on a few points that are important and, and what sort of the, the overarching theme of that is that we need to grow our economies, uh, especially in the Valley. And that really happens um, so much on the local level. Um, and I know Derby legislators can probably relate to this too, as we see, um, we start to see the beginnings of resurgence in our downtown areas. Um, you know, there are a number of issues that become very, very important. And as legislators, we all have our, you know, quote unquote, little bills that we have. And, and, you know, one of the things I learned early on is, is um, everything is important to somebody. So, you know, I've got a few things that might seem sort of innocuous and not that important, but it's important to somebody in, in, in the district. Um, that said, um, one of the things that really has become important to everyone is the issue of crime. And most specifically, um, vehicle related crime, car break-ins, um, auto theft. Um, we see it in the news every day. You see it on social media. Um, you know, it has escalated, uh, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of severity. Uh, we see more and more that, that those break-ins um, have gotten dangerous. And what that does, at least what it is, is starting to do in a lot of towns, is impact the opinions um, and the motivations of investors who are willing to put their money and their time and effort um, into redevelopment projects. Uh, and we're starting to hear that a little bit from, from local investors. I see Bill shaking his head. He may be getting some of that feedback as well. Um, in Shelton, we're actually even hearing that from the hotel community. Um, they are concerned about it. And uh, we do see legislation that has been introduced. It has been heard. Um, it struggles a little bit right now, quite frankly. There are some differences of opinion as to how we should deal um, with repeat offenders as it relates to vehicle crime, but that's a priority of mine. Um, there is a group, uh, I mean, Republicans, you know, no surprise, are generally pretty much together on this issue. Um, there is a group of more moderate Democrats who are also on board with the concept of you know, tightening penalties for repeat offenders and, and making it making these crimes a little bit more difficult and the penalty is a little bit more severe because right now a lot of these criminals um, involved in these crimes know that they're going to be back out in the street within an hour uh, if they're brought in and all. Uh, there really aren't any penalties associated with it. And if there's no penalty, um, the crime just continues. So one of my bigger priorities uh, in this session is to ensure that a version, a positive version of that legislation moves forward um, and that we do see action taken um, before the uh, end of the session. And Kelly, thanks very much. I appreciate the thank opportunity you. here. And thank you, Bill. Um, next, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Nicole Claritis Detria, uh, representing Beacon Falls, Derby, and Seymour. Um, she is co chair of the Regulations Review Committee, as well as a member of Finance, Revenue, and Bonding, and Public Health, which we all know is very active <laughs> this year as a result of the pandemic. So, um, Representative Claritis Detria, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Bill, for having us here today. Uh, we know that the Valley Chamber is the best run chamber in the state. So keep up, keep up the good work. We appreciate everything you do. We know this year our legislative process has been like no other in years past. As, and as far as priorities, our caucus has, has set COVID issues uh, as our top priorities, education, mental health, drug addiction, those are big priorities. And of course, always helping our business community because the business sector, as we've heard already from the senators, 
and and rep Perillo that it's very important. We need to help our businesses. They're struggling right now. They're drowning, and we need to keep them going. Our Minority leader, Vinnie Candelora, joined CBIA in asking the governor to use some of the federal COVID dollars to pay down our unemployment compensation fund. So those are a few things that we think are, are pretty important this legislative session to move forward with. So I could go on for an hour, so I'll <laughs> stop there and let everybody speak. But thank you again for having us here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, next, I'd like to uh, introduce Representative Kara Rochelle, who represents Ansonia and Derby. Um, last year, I think was the very first year that I had uh, the pleasure of meeting you, um, Representative Rochelle, at our last event. Um, you had been elected in 2019. Um, you currently serve as vice chair of the Commerce Committee um, and are a member of higher education and employment advancement, as well as insurance and real estate. Um, and so, um, I'd like to hear from you in terms of what are your positions or what are your concerns as you move through this session? I wanna first thank you. It's so nice to uh, meet you. It's actually, it was two years ago. Last year two we years. were shut down because of COVID. So I had just started uh, my first term as a state legislator. I was in about a month or two into my first term uh, when I first met you all two years ago. Um, and I remember uh, during that time, one of the things that we talked about was, um, you know, there's this, you know whether whether it's you know there's there's some data to show it and there's some data that is just uh that doesn't reflect that but there's this idea that Connecticut is uh you know is is on fire and the economy is terrible and that everything is falling apart in this state and that's simply the data does not does not bear that out especially now uh and so some of the things that that you know have come up recently is we just saw our bond rating increase right uh and that was the first time in 20 years that we've seen our bond rating increase uh we got, we now have a triple a rating uh, we additionally there was an article came out um about the um nonpartisan office of fiscal analysis stated that we are uh, looking at an 800 million dollar surplus Kara, we lost you your voice I do apologize. I actually had a cat touch my keyboard. So uh, the, the, the um, uh, dangers of doing this from home. Um, so, uh, you know, two years ago, one of the things I discussed was that coming into the legislature, uh, I really wanted to see more fiscal responsibility. Um, there were 70 years of unfunded pension debt uh, that I was walking into. Uh, and since two years ago, uh, for the first time in history last year, we not only paid our minimum, but more than our minimum uh, in, in starting to pay down the pension debt. And then this year, we're looking at paying down substantially more. So we're moving in the right direction there. Uh, the response from the uh, financial agencies is positive. We're getting um, you know upgrades to our ratings. We're looking at uh, the largest rainy day fund in the state's history. And so we're able to make more investments in the economy. One thing that is a high priority for me this session is the Waterbury train line. Uh, and the reason why is because that will have a transformative effect on the Valley's economy. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you, there was a recent COG study that confirmed that in the Valley, there's, um, there's 12.3 million square feet of developable space in the TOD zones around the train stations. And that's just the train stations in the Valley that, that does not include Waterbury. So when we talk about economic development and, and what can be done, that, that train is, is the domino that needs to be tipped uh, having that increased service. And thankfully, I'm sorry, let me just one second here. Um, thankfully, uh, the governor did put uh, increased train service in his budget. It's something that we've advocated for strongly over the years. And, um, and so uh, I'm grateful to see that. And we're looking at this as, as really going to have a huge effect. And I, and I know that's going to have an effect because I've already had developers reach out to me about some of the larger properties in my district. Uh, I have Ansonia and Derby, they're the number one and five most economically distressed in the state of Connecticut. And so um, that's one of my largest priorities. I'm also looking at a bill, uh, you know, I am the Vice Chair of Commerce. We have a bill that we're pushing to uh, incentivize regional economic development, um, uh, a pilot program to have a state match for regionalized economic development uh, so that we can have a stronger strategic economic development and put some skin in the game from the state. Great, thank you so much. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, I'd like to introduce Representative Mary Wielander, uh, representing Derby, Orange, and Woodbridge. Um, she is our newest representative um, for the uh, delegation uh, representing the Valley. Um, she is vice chair of the Committee on Children and a member of Education and uh, Regulation Review Committee. So um, with that, uh, Mary, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's, um, it's nice to be here today. I'm looking forward to uh, doing this in person at some point soon. Um, I think, I mean, honestly, I'm, this is, as Representative Claris Ditria mentioned, this is an unprecedented session. This is, so trying to start this process as a new legislator, doing this all remotely has been um, quite a challenge. But um, my main focuses are really a carryover from my previous experience. So I'm looking at education, I'm looking at ways that we can support our children and our families. I serve with Senator Berthel on the Education Committee and we are looking at how are our schools going to um, transition out of the pandemic. Um, I know there are some assessments that are going to be starting. So hopefully by the end of the school year, we will get a better picture of where our students are. But I think what we really have seen is that without our schools being um, open and engaged and at functioning and healthy spaces, that our economy is struggling with that without um, the, children being in our schoolhouse buildings. Um, we need to make sure that our teachers are safe and supported. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're, we're looking at. And I think my goal is to make sure that our schools and our communities have the resources that they need moving forward so that we can make sure that all of our children have the, the support that they deserve um, and that uh, we really are also looking at um, the mental health of our students and our, our communities in, in, at large going forward. There is going to be, I think, an unprecedented um, level of need and care for mental health and behavioral and emotional services within our schools. So I'm looking at um, specifically even just this morning, there is a bill that's going to be coming forward in front of the Public Health Committee that is just looking to identify the, the need of mental health resources across the state and putting forward a simple plan so that if a school or district chooses to um, put in a mental health clinic in their school district, in their school building, that they would know how. So we're trying to make common sense steps to remove barriers to care and to make sure that we can all move forward um, healthy and, and safe going. And again, when we think about our children and our families and our schools, it really does have a broad impact on, on every part of our economy and our infrastructure and our innovation. Um, so getting back to a standard, um, sort of more normal, I think is, is something we're all looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, I know at one point you had mentioned wanting to um, acknowledge some other folks that we had in the audience. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to, to do that at this point. Yes, I, I would. Thank you all for, for your remarks. And I, I understand Senator Berthel uh, needs to move on, so we may see him disappear from the screen. I hope uh, the, the remaining, you can join us for the remaining time, You know, maybe another 20 minutes or so. I want to urge our audience to uh, either raise your hand. Uh, we have the ability to bring you onto the stage. Um, or uh, uh, pen a uh, question into the chat room. Uh, but um, I'm hopeful that uh, Eric Getty uh, is with us uh, today. Uh, Eric is uh, the Vice President for Government Affairs with uh, CBIA, the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, which is Connecticut's, Connecticut's leading business organization. Nancy, if you're there, could you bring uh, Eric up uh, if he's here? Eric? Hello. And we're going to try to bring you up to the, uh, ah, there he is, ah, the magic of technology. I want to thank uh, Nancy Gray, Chamber Vice President. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, I just want to set the stage. You know, the uh, CBIA is, uh, as you know, the, the statewide uh, business organization. Um, under new leadership, uh, Christy Pantima, who's uh, joined us at our Economic Outlook Breakfast uh, just last month. And I want to thank you, Eric, uh, and your team. Uh, we have a wonderful coalition of uh, chamber presidents uh, across the state. We get together monthly. Uh, so staff support and uh, uh, policy directions provided by CBIA. Uh, I want to say uh, uh, Eric is a, is a lawyer, uh, much like you, Senator Kelly. 
Um, and prior to joining CBIA, he was an associate legislative attorney with the Legislative Commissioner's Office, uh, which is the nonpartisan uh, legal office of the General Assembly. So uh, he has sat in, in uh, your chairs um, and is now with us. So, um, Eric, uh, um, earlier in the session, uh, many legislators in many chambers uh, signed on to what was called the Rebuild Connecticut Pledge. And I know you're now trying to build a coalition uh, around economic competitiveness. This chamber's part of that as well. Do you want to kind of share some of those uh, statewide uh, collaborative uh, insights with, with our audience this morning? Yeah, absolutely. And, and first of all, thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to uh, to be here today. Uh, thank you, Kelly, uh, very much for, for, for your hosting job. And, and Bill, you always throw a great chamber meeting, whether in person or virtually. So really appreciate that. And um, it's great to see uh, so many of the legislators uh, showing up today. Uh, that's that's so important in these uh, these really uh, unusual times that we're in. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, the, the commitment to transparency, I think, uh, throughout this legislative session has been absolutely great um, for the most part, of course. Uh, we, we've had some hiccups here and there, but really uh, it, it's been good despite all the obstacles that are here. Um, thank, Bill, thank you for bringing up. We, you know, we started the whole Rebuild Connecticut campaign uh, last fall, uh, urging as many people um, to, you know, maybe put aside partisan differences for a little bit and see if we could all just coalesce around a number of, of small st first steps that we could take to help uh, get this economy going again. And, uh, you know, we, we were uh, amazed at just the number of, of legislators on both sides of the aisle that were willing to make that commitment uh, to us. And uh, even those who uh, who maybe weren't ready to commit back then um, have certainly seemed to be supportive of a lot of the issues uh, that we've raised uh, throughout the legislative session in support of that effort. So really appreciate that. Um, you know, there are uh, so many uh, 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 good things happening uh, right now in the state, but uh, and, and we really appreciate the fact that uh, the opening to the legislative on opening day the legislative session, there seem to be bipartisan calls for doing no harm, uh, coming together, uh, trying to emerge from this pandemic uh, better than we entered into it. Uh, because as, as Representative Claritas Dittria said earlier, you know, so many businesses feel like they are drowning and, and they still feel like they're drowning in many cases. You know, it's, it's been less than a year now for, for that some of them were closed for months at a time. But again, there, there are good things happening uh, and we need to keep that momentum going. You know, we have people are leaving uh, the major cities uh, near Connecticut and, and are coming here. Um, we have a lot of federal dollars flowing into the state that in the short term have alleviated some of our financial difficulties and given us a little bit of wiggle room. But of course, we are by no means uh, out of the woods on this yet. Uh, the vaccines are allowing things to, to return to some sense of normalcy. Um, you know, Connecticut still has a lot of challenges that need to be addressed. Um, uh, and, and, and we see, uh, you know, states around us making poor choices right now. You know, Massachusetts and New York are making the choice to impose huge new taxes uh, on their citizens and businesses. And it's helping drive some of those businesses here. But as Senator Kelly said earlier, we have choices in, in, in the coming weeks uh, as the session uh, starts to get to the second phase where everyone uh, is meeting in the chambers. Um, but it seems like there are certain folks within the legislature that are just determined to undermine uh, this huge opportunity we have right near, right now. You know, even as recently as yesterday, there were new bills coming out that would hike taxes on state job creators and some of the smallest businesses in the state. You know, we have we are uh, there are a lot of bills out there that are expanding labor mandates again, just uh, less than 12 months after we've had uh, month long business shutdowns. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like we've forgotten the fact that right now we have one hundred and twenty one thousand less jobs in the state than when we did uh, just one or uh, just a little over a year ago. And we're doing things like trying to create legal presumptions that anyone who contracts COVID-19 did so in the workplace, despite the fact that people visit dozens of other places every single week. So um, again, you know, the whole purpose of the Rebuild Connecticut campaign is to bring everyone together and get them to focus 
on restoring this economy uh, in this COVID world. And we certainly hope uh, all of the legislators who are here today uh, will continue on uh, with that commitment to focus on the economy and to do no harm in the coming weeks. That's great. Th thank, thank you, Eric, uh, very, very much for being with us. Uh, do no harm. I think uh, that's that's the that's the message here. This is a, a very fragile time. In fact, last evening uh, I, on the drive home, I heard uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell uh, say that we're on an inflection point right now. You know, our economy um, is poised uh, nationally to really explode. Uh, in the third and four, fourth quarter, but of course we're also dealing with the public health issue in the uh, in places like Michigan, of course, and, and uh, New Jersey, closer to home. Um, we're all very concerned. And, and uh, Nicole, thank you for for your comments about public health. Um, Nancy, can you bring up Todd Liu? Is Todd with us this morning? Todd, are you there? Let's see if we can bring him up to the screen. And we'll give it a second. Um, you know, I sit here uh, to our senators and representatives, uh, the chamber's international headquarters here at 10 Progress Drive. We're right above the uh, Griffin Vaccination Center, uh, where I, I see every day from six to six, doing a thousand uh, vaccinations per day, uh, over 7,000 per week. Um, if Todd is not there, I will simply uh, thank him um, and Pat Chamel, by extension, not only our largest employer in the Valley, but uh, really leading. Uh, now, Todd is not on, so Todd, I just got the text. Uh, but to thank them you know, publicly for their leadership, as well as the Naugatuck Valley Health District um, uh, for their support as well. So with that, we're going to uh, throw out some questions. I did have one, Kelly, that came in. Um, we saw our headline uh, uh, in the Connecticut Post, New Haven registered the other day about the uh, uh, air service. We had a lot of talk about trans uh, transportation infrastructure nationally, uh, but the debate about uh, Sikorsky versus uh, Tweed. Uh, does anybody have an opinion <laughs> as to where that might be centered? You know, it's uh, uh, we st uh, straddle those two airports, but uh, somebody has raised uh, uh, concern about that. Does anybody want to take a, a stab at that? Nobody? Okay, <laughs> we'll let that one go. All right, so let's throw out for, for some general discussion. Um, last uh, evening uh, on public television, uh, we're very proud to have uh, uh, Secretary of Education Cardona uh, spoke very eloquently about about this opportunity right now. Uh, this is school vacation week. I noticed that this morning uh, coming by the schools. Uh, so the schools are quiet uh, once again. Uh, but one of the things that he pointed out, and Mary Wielander, this is really to you. Um, there was a survey that said uh, one third of America's teachers thought about a career change this past year. So you talk about the emotional toll, uh, not only on our students, uh, but on our teachers. Uh, and uh, Secretary Cardona said that, you know, this is an opportunity to really address the issue of equity in public education, right? Really, truly uh, to ensure that uh, uh, education is properly funded, um, uh, you know, across this country, uh, we pay special attention to our, our inner cities and communities like in Sonia and Derby. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I believe we have Joe DeBacco on the, on the call, call this, this morning, morning as, as well. well. Mary? Mary? Sure, I will, I will do my best. Um, I think, one of the main challenges, and you sort of alluded to that, is the fact that we there is such a disparity, in, even in our own state and even in New England, um, on how our schools are funded and how they operate. And a lot of times that can be a strength because, for example, in my district in Orange, we were able to um, be open in person full time for elementary school students since August. So we are actually almost ahead of curriculum in some classes because everyone has been in the classroom and we haven't been able to do the extra activities. And so we haven't had the children pulled from the classroom for certain things. So our teachers have been able to um, progress with the curriculum at, at an expected rate. That's not the case in all of our schools, obviously. And so they're and the way that each district supports their teachers is also very different. And I think there was a lot of challenges in the beginning of the pandemic because there were certain um, federal regulations and federal support structures that were in place that ended up lapsing uh, in terms of where 
if there was exposure, if there was quarantine needed, um, who, where would that time come from? How are we gonna cover the classrooms? I think we're, the pandemic has exposed a lot of, of challenges and inequities in our schools. And so I hope we can all look at having those types of conversations and say, you know, this is something that all of our, our students succeeding means our con like our our society succeeds. Um, so I think I'm hoping that our teachers will feel more supported going into the next school year, um, that we can um, give them the the space and the the structure that is needed. But again, it, a lot of it comes down to individual school districts. From BHA, um, who was asking, asking whether there were any relief from Connecticut nonprofits this year, um, that they've been underfunded for 10 years and the significant safety net they, that they provide is not sustainable. Um, and I was wondering if anyone might be in a position to answer that. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I think you're muted. Do we have a raise hand feature? Because I was looking I, for it. I can't find it. There is one out there. Like I this. Can't raise my hand. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll take a, I have a couple comments about our nonprofits. We know um, we've been trying to get our nonprofits access to the COVID relief funds. And we know our, we've said this year after year, our nonprofits do it better, do better with their services that, and more efficiently than we do on the state level. And especially during COVID, we've had the increased um, increased incidence of domestic violence and drug addiction issues. So we've we've the both caucuses have been pushing the Republican caucuses to get some of those funds for our nonprofits to help them get through this as well. I think it's it's very important to continue to support them and the great work that they do. You know, and I'll just add to that. I think we're sort of at a point, and and you know. Mike, Mike's been going to these, you know, coming to these for years. He's heard a lot of these answers time, you know, year after year. But you reach a point where you decide whether or not private providers should be competing with the state of Connecticut and the state's provision of services. And that's sort of kind of where we are. And it's kind of where we've been. Um, you know, we, what Nicole said is right. You know, our private providers do an excellent job. Um, as well or arguably better, I would argue better, um, than state agencies, and they do it at a far lower cost. So what sort of underlies all of this debate year after year, the debate about whether or not we increase funding to our private providers, really comes down to not so much do we fund the programs, but who do we fund to provide those programs? And you know, we've started to reach a point here in Connecticut, in my opinion, where um, it's becoming more and more clear and quite frankly is, is, is extremely clear um, that we need to start shifting the provision of services to under, our underserved populations to the private provider community more and more, um, that they should be serving a greater percentage of those in our community who need to be served. Um, and once you see that mindset change, if you see that mindset change, um, private providers can start to see uh, more funds come their way. But I'll just be honest, in, 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 until um, the legislature is willing to say, all right, let's invest in pr private providers. I don't see that you're going to see that change. That's just my honest opinion. And I agree with, with what uh, Jason is saying here, that in a day and age when government needs to do more because there's more demand, more need with less because Connecticut taxpayer, I think, is at the brink. This partnership, a pr public-private partnership with the nonprofit community is a way to deliver better quality human services to folks in need. The governor commissioned the Mathematica report to study the effects of COVID in nursing homes. And one of the biggest findings on the Mathematica report showed that the low reimbursement rate, the low Medicaid reimbursement rate, was at the cause of many of those poor health outcomes. The same thing here is present. What we have is a state government that balances its budget on human services. And what we should be focused on 
is how do we provide better quality services, core services to people in need when they need it? And I think there's a path forward. It's a partnership with our private nonprofits. We do that right now with the Connecticut Home Care Program. We've been doing it for decades and doing it well. Why we don't value that experience and build upon it so that we can serve the client population in need, the people who actually depend on government. So I would think now armed with that Mathematica uh, report that the legislature would be looking at putting more money into this. Unfortunately, so far, all we've seen is the governor's budget. He didn't do it. As a matter of fact, he rolled back some initiatives, significant initiatives like the MSP program for seniors. Uh, and so we need to be vigilant here because I think this is the better way and the path forward. It is something we've been advocating for and would like to see occur. I'd like to if, jump in for a moment. Uh, if you, is it okay if I jump in for a moment? Yeah, sure. please do. Yeah, so I just want to, you know, echo what my colleagues are saying. Um, you know, we all signed a letter uh, very recently to send to the governor. Uh, specifically to advocate for BH Care and nonprofits like BH Care to push for this increased funding. Um, there was an article that came out in early January um, indicating uh, and, and reporting on the, the pledge that was made by the co-chairs of the Appropriation Committee, Senator Kathy Austin and Representative Tony Walker for increased funding for nonprofits. And there was an article that just came out, I was searching for it just now, uh, just this past week, um, discussing these specific budget me mechanisms that they're looking to use in order to um, in order to force for increased funding. So this is a high priority, uh, you know, for this session. I, I think that all legislators have a keen awareness of, of how the past year has truly um, injured uh, communities and, and, and made a much uh, larger demand for social services, but also that, that you know, we, we've been aware of the problem for years and have been pushing. So now is the time to get it done. And I am cautiously optimistic that with the commitment from, from you know, everybody on both sides of the aisle that we can get it done this year. I want to encourage uh, uh, those of you on the call to uh, uh, type your uh, questions into the chat area if you can find it, um, or if you're brave enough to come up uh, to the stage, we welcome you to welcome you to do so. Um, Senator, I want to pick up on on your major point that you began with, and and thank you for for uh, mentioning the uh, low reimbursement rate uh, with respect to Medicaid in in our senior care centers and. Because that was the epicenter of you know of this crisis um, across the country, so thank you for acknowledging that. Um, tell us what is the next step with respect to healthcare. You talk about the three different proposals: the Democratic version, the Governor's version, the Republican version. Are we negotiating? And uh, what what might we expect? To what, what's your prediction is going to be the <laughs> the outcome? Oh, uh, or nothing well, at all. You know, is it possible that nothing at all, uh, that there is no consensus and, and we take well, a pass I, on it this year? I would certainly hope we wouldn't do that. Uh, we have been pushing hard to bring relief to middle class Connecticut families in this in, in this lane uh, because, you know, a health care uh, insurance premium runs more than on average, more than two thousand dollars a month uh, to the average family. And that's just way too high. Uh, I think. We do, and let me back up, we are having conversations. Uh, there is discussions going forward. Um, I'm hopeful uh, that we pick the option that keeps the Connecticut jobs. I think the public option is a real dangerous option because it's not insurance. It's proposed, it's a government health care payment program uh, where people would pay a fee and the government would pay your health care costs. Uh, it's the best example so far in the experience has been the partnership plan uh, that is being run under the comptroller's office. Uh, for the past two years, it's run 40 million in the red and it's projected this year to be about 90 million in the red. Mm. And the problem with that are several. First and foremost is that the Connecticut taxpayer is the backstop. So the taxpayers are gonna soak up those, those debts but more importantly, because it's not insurance, it's not regulated by the insurance department. And we've got one of the best regulators uh, in the country. And that's why this program is not actuarially sound and runs in the red. And the second and more importantly is because it's not insurance, it doesn't have the protections of the Affordable Care Act. 
And in fact, the present version of the public option gives the comptroller the ability to discriminate between who he allows into the program and who he doesn't allow into, into the program. So if you have people in your pool that have pre-existing conditions, there is the likelihood, the possibility that the comptroller could say, no, we're not going to extend coverage to you. Uh, that's really what a lot of you hear from uh, that team says is the problem with the insurance industry. Now, the governor has the reinsurance as we do, uh, and that works within the current construct. You keep your insurance, you keep your doctors, you keep the current system, but you provide relief by getting uh, dollars in leveraging federal money. Where we really differ is we want to get our arms around uh, the cost drivers, not just look at this as an insurance issue, but actually the underlying medical costs. And so we're working in what's called benchmarking to lower the cost year over year of growth. Uh, and then also, uh, once again, looking to keep these good paying Connecticut jobs. If we work with the insurance industry that has been very good to the state of Connecticut, uh, I think we, we grow jobs and we can grow jobs in that area uh, and yet still provide the same premium relief. We have a different perspective on that. The governor wants to tax insurance policies. Uh, that's gonna raise the cost of the product in the name of lowering it, where we're gonna take a general fund appropriation, which other states have demonstrated. And this is a, a the Wakely report, which was commissioned by the exchange, uh, said that our way was the most effective way to bring the most relief uh, by leveraging the federal dollars. Uh, so hopefully these conversations continue, and more importantly, uh, that we bring relief to the middle class family and businesses of Connecticut. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'd I like think to uh, Representative ahead. Rochelle was hoping yeah. to. Yeah, respond. please do, Kara. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to hop in and, and share, a, you know, a different perspective. Um, I think that there uh, certainly is a conversation to be had, and it's important that we. Um, you know, let folks uh, understand the, the full lay of the land on, on where we are with this. So um, the first thing to be aware of is the fact that uh, with the American Rescue Plan, there have been some pretty substantive adjustments uh, to the Affordable Care Act uh, as far as um, what affordable insurance will be available in the, in the coming years. Uh, so that's something um, where we're going to see a lot of middle income residents that uh, now are going to be paying a much lower premium um, or are going to be able to get a higher level of coverage uh, for what they're currently paying. Um, as far as the state level goes, um, you know, re regarding uh, the Republican um, uh, proposal, there's a few things that just need to be highlighted because there is work to be done. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the about the public option proposal and, and how it differs. Um, so the first thing to know is that the, the, the Republican proposal is currently unfunded. Um, it actually would put a $90 million deficit into the budget. Uh, and um, the reinsurance provision in it, um, it, it doesn't really make sense because the Biden plan gets rid of the the insurance cliff which is you know part of what the reinsurance would try to address it, it, it's already been re addressed because of the federal um adjustments that have currently been made um the other thing to be aware of is that the plan um doesn't address costs for small businesses and nonprofits, which is part of what the um public option does address so what the public option says is that if you're a small business or a nonprofit and you want to offer insurance or be able to compete with the larger uh, organizations that can offer insurance, um, you can now purchase the same health care that I have and my colleagues have. So it's saying that um, if you're a mom and pop, you can now purchase the state insurance that we have uh, and that, um, you know, by purchasing it all together, we can help lower the cost. So it takes out the middleman. Um, but this is the, this is Anthem Blue Cross currently. This is not, uh, you know, we're not in the business of working, you know, delivering the insurance. This is, a, you know, we're working with actual insurance companies. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there because, um, you know, it, it is important that we're clear about this. And I do think there's going to be a lot of negotiation this year, and it's important to have healthy and spirited discussion. Um, but I encourage folks, um, Kevin Lembo, our, our controller, has worked on this issue for years. Um, he does have a website I'm trying to pull up uh, to share with you all so that you can click through and read for yourself some of the details about these plans um, and the benefits it can really have for small businesses and nonprofits. Just, just a quick response, uh, Bill. I agree with uh, what Representative Rochelle said about the American Rescue Act, uh, which actually poises Connecticut for a unique opportunity because that's only a temporary fix. It's going to be about two years. 
And this will give us opportunity to do two things. One is to allow the 1332 waiver to leverage federal money to get through that process working with the federal government. And it also will give the benchmarking aspect of our bill opportunity to actually take root and start to drop the cost of healthcare year over year. Uh, and if we were able to do the same reduction in cost of healthcare in Connecticut and spread that across our state employee, retiree and Medicaid programs and save, you know, in, in Massachusetts, it was 10% down to 4%. If we could save five or 6% uh, across those lines, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to the state of Connecticut's budget. Uh, that's more than enough to pay for the Republican plan. So we have an opportunity now to take root, to get these building blocks, the foundation in place to make the savings real for Connecticut families. And we aren't going to just pick and choose like nonprofits and small business. This would be across the board for everyone who purchases insurance in the state of Connecticut. I think that's what we have to start looking at uh, when we start to make choices in Hartford is not pick the winners and losers but allow everyone the opportunity to not only participate, perform, but to succeed. Let me, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me uh, switch, we have a couple of minutes left. I wanna just come back to the infrastructure question. Um, Representative Rochelle talks about uh, the Waterbury branch line as an opportunity and you know, I, I share your enthusiasm, uh, certainly pre-pandemic, but what we've seen of course is, um, that a, a precipitous drop in ridership on MTA, who are down, like down 90 percent. Uh, now it's 75 percent. Uh, but first, of course, we have to restore confidence uh, that people are willing to, to ride the train. But I agree it, it can be a catalyst for growth. Um, uh, congratulations to you, uh, Jason. Um, I know the Derby Shelton Bridge as a signature bridge is going to be beautiful when it's done. Uh, is now uh, under construction. It began on April 1st. Uh, and that will lead to the reconstruction of Route 34 right through the very heart of, of Main Street Derby and hopefully be the catalyst to uh, see redevelopment on the, uh, the south side of Main Street. So well, I guess we can all agree that we need a hefty investment in infrastructure. There's talk at the national level and a lot of debate you know, over the next 90 days, but something will come out. How do we best position this state to take advantage of that, to ensure that we have the state match uh, we had a false start last year with tolls. Uh, gas tax is uh, on the decline. Electric vehicles are on the rise. So does anybody want to take a, a, a stab at that? Uh, what do you think is the best prescription for the state to to, to take full advantage? Um, Ed, is particularly with a with, uh, congressional delegation, you know, working with Rosa and Jim and, and so forth. So Jason, do you want to start with that and talk about the bridge? We're excited about that. Well, I, I, I think actually, um, the Derby Shelton Bridge is actually a great example of the little things that can be done that have a very big impact. Mm. Um, you, you know, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm talking about, and, and Bill mentioned, uh, the uh, concrete arch bridge that runs between uh, Route 34 and Derby and over the river into um, onto Route 110 and Shelton. Um, and the enhancements to that bridge, um, both in terms of uh, traffic patterns and also they, largely aesthetically um, access for pedestrians. It's not a big project. I mean, everything's expensive, but in the greater scheme of things in the state of Connecticut, it's not a big project. But when you look at what that can do for the economies of Derby and Shelton, um, two downtowns that, as I mentioned previously, are really on the precipice of success. Um, this is a great example of how we can allocate funds to very finite projects um, and see a direct benefit from it. Um, I, I, will, I will say, and I, I don't typically say this very often because I'm usually in, in the minority, especially in chamber circles, but I'm not a huge believer in the Waterbury branch line. Um, I think that to get it to the level it needs to be to attract the ridership it needs, um, I, I just don't see that making sense from a financial perspective. Uh, I know some people don't want to hear that, but I think I think we have to at the same time, while we can acknowledge that some local projects make sense, like the bridge, some may not make sense. Um, and again, Bill, to your to your point previously about the future of mass transit um, and what that looks like in Connecticut, we may see that that um, who, who knows what that environment is 
in one, five, 10 years. Um, but, but that's sort of, a, that, that's a, a, an answer to your question, Bill. It's, it's, I tried to focus that locally to see how we're going to have to prioritize how money is spent um, and ensure that um, what we do spend has a ripple effect and an economic impact that's greater than simply, hey, we spent $30 million to improve a bridge. Mm. It can't just be that simple. Others, Nicole? Hi, thank you. Uh, we, we also, for our infrastructure, we need to work on balancing, as we know, the STF, the Special Transportation Fund. We know that the uh, TCI, that the Transportation and Climate Initiative, initiative creates a gas tax, um, and that's at a regional level, and then distributes that money on a regional level. We don't we don't know how that's how that would pan out. It, to focus on the STF, which we started pushing with our bipartisan budget in 2017, um, we need we need to figure those things out. Transferring of the car sales tax into the transportation fund to fund it, we've been pushing for years. It's just it's like we've said time and time again to prioritize the special tra transportation fund is important. People have mentioned the extra sales tax, the truck tax um, for trucks that go through Connecticut that would hit disproportionately hit our businesses in Connecticut. And as we know, if they get hit with an extra tax, they're going to pass that tax down to the consumers and it, it'll trickle down. It'll it's it's another tax we will end up the consumers will pay another tax and our services and our goods will all be more expensive. So I don't necessarily think you know, that's the right answer, but we need to continuously look into what we can do to help the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, why don't we ask each, uh, have you a final word? Uh, Mary, why don't we go with you, then Kara and um, uh, Representative Wielander. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Um, I just, I wanted to just quickly make an observation that I think we, we are poised at a position where we are going to be, we have the opportunity to look at different solutions. We have the opportunity to look in different directions to try to solve these problems that have been here for decades within the state. I think what we need to do though, is we need to acknowledge the fact that we are already paying for a lot of these choices. The, the consumer that is being, the, those costs are already being passed on to the consumer, whether we have the truck tax or we have the, um, you know, a different kind of healthcare option. If people don't have affordable healthcare, they're gonna go to the emergency room. If they can't pay for the emergency room, that cost gets passed on to the consumer already. It gets passed to everybody. It gets, when we look at our road damage and how, you know, we're paying as a, as a individual, if my roads aren't maintained, because we don't have the funding for it as a state, then my car is getting damaged. I'm the one who has to take it to the body shop and make sure that the axles are realigned and everything else is repaired because of the wear and tear that is at a higher level because we don't have an infrastructure base within our own state and our community. So I, I think that when we are looking at these solutions, it is really important to have bipartisan input. It's really important to look at different perspectives because we are all coming from those different understandings and those different skills when we look at problem solving. But I really hope that we can acknowledge that there is already a, a financial and fiscal burden to small businesses, to middle class families, to our schools, to our state that is here. And I, I, I hope we can put aside some things to actually find solutions that will work for, for everyone um, and be supportive so we can grow and move forward. Um, I know that's probably not the wrap up question that you were hoping for, Bill. Um, I do have another meeting that I need to attend to, um, but I am really grateful for this opportunity this morning to, to listen to my colleagues. Um, I look forward to meeting people more in person. I serve with Senator Kelly on Reg's Review and we've never met in person. So I'm looking forward to that. Wow. Um, and, uh, and getting back to, you know, a, a normal, more collaborative, um, experience, which is what I've heard that this, this legislative body is really about. So, um, thank you for the opportunity this morning, Kelly. Thank you for moderating. And, um, I look forward to continuing to, uh, to work with everyone. All right. 
Well, we will, we will leave you at that. It is now approaching uh, 10 past nine. I want to thank uh, you, Kelly, first of all, for, for uh, uh, introducing and moderating today's panel. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Kelly, Senator Berthel, Representative Perillo, Representative Claritas Dittria, Rochelle, uh, and uh, Mary Wielanda. Thank you also very much. I want to wish you all the best. The session goes till June 7th, I believe, on or about June 7th. Much work to be done. Uh, we will keep our members uh, apprised um, of uh, the uh, discussions uh, underway. Uh, I know it's all virtual uh, still uh, uh, via Zoom uh, for all of you. So uh, we will let you go, uh, bid you well. And let's say, uh, don't forget uh, uh, April showers do bring May flowers. It's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna rain, <laughs> rain uh, terribly today. Maybe a little snow up in the Northwest corner oh. uh, tomorrow, but thank you all very, very much. We thank you everybody. Time. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now.